This morning, Robinson preached, and it's late evening over in Pakistan, but this morning, Robinson preached at a large church, and it was exciting for him to share the gospel from the book of Hebrews. And he, he told them <laughs> they had to leave religion. And uh, that'll freak people out. And people have asked me, said, are, you're very religious, aren't you? And I say, no, not at all. And they look at me like, well, you heretic. I said, no, I'm a Christian. It's life, it's not religion. And it's life, it's not religion. That's free. Today we're going to be continuing in Philippians chapter 1. And we're going to be get, begin in verse 12 and go to the end of the chapter. And we're just going to look at some stuff. But I've got some names for it. And here's one of them. Here's the dilemma that Paul was facing while he was in a Roman prison. And it was so cool what happened while he was in this prison. We think things have to go right to be used of God. It's kind of funny, Paul. Everything was going wrong, and yet all God did was use him to not just change a country, Rome, but the world-dominating power, Rome. Paul was faced with this dilemma, and here's the title. To go home or to stay? And you say, what do you mean to go home? Well, heaven. It was his home, just like yours. You say, well, where is heaven? That's wherever Jesus is. Do you know that you are presently right now in heaven? You may not know it. Some can be presently right now in hell, and, and, and they know it. Well, they don't know what all that entails, but it's so different than what we've already thought. But here was Paul's dilemma. To go home or to stay on earth? Well, heaven is a place for now. We are with him now, but we're bound by time, so we don't see what is. Another subtitle. What the devil meant for bad, God meant for good. All the things on the earth that kind of bind us and kind of uh, slow us down or whatever, we look at it and think, boy, if only this was, if we could only deal with this, if we could get out of this situation, oh, what could happen? And yet, are you ready? God is sovereign. And so there's nothing that happens to you or to anyone else that God's not in control of. You say, you mean, you think that yeah, that's fatalism. No, it's not. I'm just telling you, God is so big. He doesn't just, this sounds kind of harsh, allow things. Now, does it, is God in killing people and all this stuff? Is God in all the wickedness that goes on the earth? No, that's, that's man, that's flesh. But I can tell you right now, God is in control. And God knows how it all turns out. And here's the good news. God knows not only how it will all turn out, but in eternity, it is already turned out. Because eternity has no time involved. It has no beginning. It has no end. Now, here's the thing that I don't understand. One of my friends here, Johnny, spoke and said, you know, it's too big for my head to understand I believe it. Well, there's the problem. Some people don't believe it because it, their head can't understand it. And if their head can't understand it, it can't be true. But here it is. It had already all worked out in eternity before God created anything in time. Now, that's cool, isn't it? When you think about that, you think, that is just too much. Okay, we're going to pick up in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. We were looking at all the things Paul said he had to be thankful for in the first 11 verses in this Philippians 1. And now we're going to look at the gospel being preached. Now understand where Paul is while the gospel is being preached. He is chained to guards, one on one side, one on the other side, in a Roman prison. He was in prison two times, we believe. The first time he was released and he actually did go back to where he wanted to go. The second time he was released permanently. Cut his head off. He's in a prison, chained on one side to a guard and chained on the other side to a guard. And yet he wrote, my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. You say, what he couldn't go preach? Really? Well, let's look. Let's look. How many people do you think today would make this statement? Hey, things are working out perfect. It's like Hannibal used to say on 18. I just love it when a plan comes together. I've got an idea. Let's go to prison and let me be chained to guards 
for the rest of my life till they cut my head off. That'll work. Would we say that? I don't think so. That's what Paul did. Paul realized that it was not about him. Paul knew who was in control and he trusted him. Now this is the biggie. And I could say, I wish I had this down, which I don't, but I'm learning. He looked, Paul looked at everything from God's perspective. He looked at everything from God's perspective. So he can say, my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Verse 13. And before I say that, Paul knew he was in control, like I say. He trusted him. In verse 13, so that my imprisonment in the, and it says, in the cause of, that's not in the English. Let me read it the way it says it in the Greek. So that my imprisonment in Christ, not the cause of Christ. See, we have to add stuff like that. My imprisonment in Christ. God's not going to cause something through all this bad. He just said, my imprisonment in Christ. Christ is here. I'm in Christ. He's in me. There's no place that you can go that the gospel cannot be shared. My imprisonment in Christ has become well known. Look at this. Throughout their whole, and we were debating on how to pronounce this next word, praetorian guard and to everyone else. Now those are the ones that were guarding Paul, the praetorian guard. Here they were. And I thought, you know, I've always known about these guys, but I think I'll just look it up and see what we're talking about here. Well, these were the ones guarding Paul, and they were the elite of the elite of all the Roman soldiers. They served as bodyguards for emperors. They were escorts for senators. And they were the secret service of the day, <laughs> even to the point of overthrowing emperors. They were the secret service with SEAL Team 6 kicked in on steroids. They were the baddest of the bad. They were the elite troops, and they were the ones that were under control. Well, all that power was assigned to guard Paul. Now you say, why did they do that? Because God was in control. Now look, look. Those guys kept trusting Christ. Paul had this, this captive audience there that he could share the gospel, the death, the burial, and resurrection. And when those guys would leave and wherever they went, the gospel was shared. The elite of the elite was the ones that God chose to reveal this message of His grace to. And so when they went and shared it, do you know who it was that did away the Praetorian Guard, however you say it? It was Constantine. You know what happened in Constantine's reign? That's when he declared Rome to be a Christian country. You say, where are they? You know, God knows. But I'm telling you that it impacted emperors. The ones that, if Paul had not been chained to those guards, do you think any of this would have happened? No. They were the elite of the elite, and they were signed to guard Paul. You say, how do I know all this stuff? Then he goes on to say, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment. Who's he talking about? We're talking about these guards, the praetorian guards. Paul was the one they were chained to. Now look, this is the same sentence. There's a comma separating them. We're not talking about the brethren back home. We're not even talking about the brethren in the house churches. We're talking about these guards. He called them brethren. What were they doing? Trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment. Now look at this. Have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. We're talking about the ones that were guarding Paul. If you look at the context... We're talking about the ones that were guarding Paul. Now, others also had the fear gone and were able to preach and share, but we're talking about the guards. The guard was trusting Christ and then boldly speaking for Christ. Now, here's the, here's the bottom line. The people could not stop them because they had too much power. You see how God works things? 
what looks like terrible situations, God's in control. Paul was in the oven. And the heat was turned up to the point of he died. Now what would we try to do if we were dealing with this? We'd do all we can to get him out. Wouldn't we? And rightfully so. I would. And you would too. You know what we'd want to do? We'd want to cut the oven off before the cake was done. What happens? I'm not a baker. My wife bakes. I'm sure you ladies bake. I don't know about you guys. But uh, if you turn the oven off too soon or you don't get it hot enough, what happens to the cake? It falls. You're not a very good cake. In fact, not only do you, turn the, you leave the heat up, but you turn it up before you ever put the cake in there. You preheat that sucker. And then you put the, you know, you get to the, you open that door. Have y'all ever opened the oven to, whew, the heat, you know, just kind of, kind of back up? That's where Paul was. That's where some of you are now. And it looks like, God, please do away with this thing. God is in control. Had Paul not been there, we wouldn't see what we're seeing today. He was in control. Then he goes on to say in verse 15, Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. So we got two folks right here, two groups. First of all, there's the jealousy of the gospel. One group, some preaching out of jealousy. Okay, but what were they doing? Preaching. Okay, they were preaching. Wrong motives, preaching. They don't get the blessing. They're not, they're not receiving the blessing that is theirs. Some people say, well, God's not blessing them. God blesses everybody. The Bible says He causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. So yeah, they're being blessed. They just don't receive it. They're not getting it. But they were preaching the gospel. Some were preaching out of goodwill. They just wanted other people to know about it. He said, the latter do it out of love knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. Now, Paul, what can you do? You're in jail. Well, we've already seen that God was using him to impact all of Rome through the strongest people in Rome. But for the, for, uh, the defense of the gospel, this word defense of the gospel, this is apologetics. So what's Paul doing? He has time. He's not traveling. He's not making tents. He's not doing anything. He has time to write letters. And he wrote a big percentage of the New Testament while he was in prison, one place and then another. He's defending the gospel, the apologetics. How is he doing that? Because he is sharing the unadulterated truth of the gospel. Paul shares the gospel. How do you defend the gospel? Simple. Share the gospel and leave out the crud. Leave out the do's and the don'ts and just share the dids. Do away with the do. Do away with the don't and share the did, what Christ did. But you see what we do, we leave out the part what Christ did and we share what you should do and shouldn't do. That's what we do. That's not the gospel. That's not the defense of the gospel and it's not apologetics. What it is is heresy. What people call defense is actually what I would call heresy. If you're sharing that you have any part in this, that's heretical. All right. Verse 17. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me to stress in my imprisonment. They thought it was going to make him mad. One time when Philip, uh, one of my staff guys years ago, he was a 16-year-old boy that I met. He's now a PhD and he's pastored for years and years and he was one of my associates. I literally, when I moved where I am now, brought him down here with me as a young boy. And he was gifted and I was real proud of him, still am. And one day I was gone and Philip, and he was probably 18 or 19 or 20, you know, young, maybe 21, I don't remember, he was young. And uh, he was one of my staff guys then. And this older lady came up to me and says, Man, we didn't even miss you while you were gone. Philip preached so great. Now, whether she meant it for good or not, I don't know. But here's how I took it. Hey, she's bragging on one of my kids. And so I looked at her and I said, Ma'am, you'll never make me mad by bragging on one of my children. Her face dropped. 
<laughs> she walked away. <laughs> and that's what God was doing with Paul here. So, even though their motives weren't good, the gospel was being shared. He says selfish ambition. We have people preaching today out of selfish ambition. They want to be known. Some of them want to have the biggest church. Some of them do it for money. The gospel is the gospel. You say, well, can anybody hear the gospel from one of those people? Well, of course they can, because it's not about them, even though they don't know it. And others do it out of pure motive. But God's still God. Some wanted to harm Paul by preaching. This is crazy. Isn't it crazy? It's twisted thinking. And you know what's really tragic? Same thing goes on today. Paul says in verse 18, What then? Because of all this, what then? He said, Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. Yes, I rejoice. Couldn't make Paul mad by preaching the gospel. Couldn't do it. And this is a mighty good lesson for today. And here it is. Christ is bigger and better than anyone can know. Just like with Philip or one of my children. Now, one of my friends, you know, some of you know him. He was really, really sick and really nobody thought he was going to live. And my son said, yep, the Lord's already told me he's got 20 more years. I'm not even worried about it. So he'd pray, but he did, I think, mostly for us, Darwin, more than for you because he already knew. And, uh, and Darwin told me the other day, kind of hurt my feelings. What your son said really encouraged me. Now, nothing you said did, but what he said was really good. Well, I thought, praise God. Man, God used my son to encourage a guy. <clears throat> You're not going to make me mad about that. It's like, you know, you look at your children and you look at them and you're so proud of them. And you may or may not do anything, but you look at your kids. Now, when I say what they've done, I'm not talking about how they've risen to high ranks. I'm not talking about that. Why are you proud of them? Because they're yours. But it's so exciting as they begin to share this message of the unmerited favor of God based totally on His will and desire and has nothing to do with mankind. God loves you, period, because that is His nature. All right. For I know, verse 19, that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. One time it did. I believe he was released from one of the Roman captivities. The second time he was released permanently. Had his head cut off. But Paul wasn't worried about it. How do I know? We're going to see. It'll turn out for my deliverance through your prayers. It's like the time the guy said, I can't trust Christ. I was talking to him. I was at his house. It's kind of cool. And he said, I can't trust Christ because if I did, I couldn't do my job. <laughs> I got to be a tough guy. <laughs> I said, you mean your job's stopping you from trusting Christ? Yep, that's right. I said, man, I did not know that. I said, well, listen, can I pray for you? He said, yeah, you can pray for me. He said, you didn't really do what I'm about to tell you. I really did. And so I stand up, put my head, I said, Lord, please cause this dear man to lose his job. Because, Lord, I wouldn't want anything to stand in the way of him trusting you and you revealing, you revealing to him how much you love him. So, Lord, just cause him to lose his job. Lord, let him get fired or quit. Amen. I said, I'll see you. He had this look, and I've tried to give it to you. I didn't know you were going to pray for me like that. I said, man, you said your job was keeping you from trusting Christ. I said, I don't want that to stop you. Guess what? He did trust Christ. Guess what he did after he trusted Christ? Quit his job. He was right. That was kind of cool, though. You say, well, I would never do anything like that. I recommend you don't do that unless God tells you to. But if he tells you to, do it. He says in verse 20, According to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, and that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as we always, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul looked at this situation as something God was in control over. And he wasn't worried about it. It wasn't his situation. It was God's situation. 
he knew that what he was going into before he left Jerusalem. Do you remember somebody came to him and bound him with a belt? And he said, this is going to be you if you go. He said, if you go, you're going to be bound and chained. The Lord told me. Guess what? They were right. He was. You know what Paul said? He said, don't bring me sorrow. Don't do that. I just know I'm supposed to go. It's kind of like Robinson when I went to Pakistan. A lot of my friends said, you're going where? And I knew I was supposed to go the first time. I knew I was supposed to go. And, uh, and some things like that could have happened. And, and when the police came that time to get me and you wouldn't let me go and you went instead, came to the hotel, and I was terrified. I wasn't very spiritual. I didn't handle it like Paul at all. Robinson, he went instead of me. He went in my stead. And uh, I just knew this. I was supposed to go. And I don't recommend you go any place that God doesn't tell you to go. But if He says go, go. Okay. Really cool. And then in verse 21, this is one of the most quoted verses in the Bible. This is where we're going. And this is why Paul was in good shape no matter what. He said, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now this is a great verse unless you're about to die. You know what I mean? Yeah, Lord, I believe that. You're going to die. Whoa, Lord, whoa. God's in control. Let me ask you another thing. From the world's perspective, can you die? What's the worst anybody could do to you? Kill you. Okay. From God's perspective, can you die? No. From our perspective, we die. From God's perspective, finally, we're set free. You say, but we're not going to have a body anymore. Really? We're going to have the same kind of body that Christ had. A glorified body. No pain. It's not going to be old. I don't believe it's going to be infant. I don't think we're going to see a lot of pre-born babies rolling around heaven. I think we're going to see fully formed, uh, grown-up people that were murdered. Now, this is not a thing on abortion, although I'm totally against it. But I'm telling you, to be set free is to become who we already are, but we don't know it. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. One of the biggest statements Paul ever made. And you can think about this in relation to your own life. He says in verse 22, but, he's going on to explain it. If, and then it says, I am in the English, it's not in the Greek, but it says, but if to live, and he says to live on in the English. I, you know, sometimes I just wish they'd leave it alone because this is how it would read and it reads fine. But if to live in the flesh, and then he said this will mean, and it will mean is not in the English either. I'm not in the Greek, but it is in the English. Let me read it. But if to live on, I'm sorry, to live in the flesh, this fruitful labor for me, what is this fruitful labor for me? To live in this physical body. It's fruitful labor. Produces fruit. Why? Because Christ is the one living through him. That's John chapter 15. This fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. Paul said, I stay here. Fruitful labor. Now, understand where he is. He is bound by chains to the Praetorian Guard. And he calls it fruitful labor. He said, I don't know what to choose. But here's the good news. Ultimately, it was not up to him, neither is it up to you. He says in verse 23, But I am hard pressed from both, and it says directions in the English, got no problem with that, it's not in the Greek, but I am hard pressed from both having the desire to depart. Notice which one he put first. Having the desire to depart. That was his desire. And be with Christ. And he's not just talking about being with Christ. like He's already with Christ, but he was going to be literally unhindered by anything that was hindering him on this earth. For the, that is much better. Very much better, he says. That is very much. In, in, in the Spanish, and I, I tease, I, when I talk to Robinson, sometimes I speak Spanish, and 
and uh, mucho mas. I like the way the Spanish say that. Mucho mas. Not just better. Much better. It's much better to be there than here. Paul knows it. Now, Paul had seen heaven. He said, whether I was in this body or not, I don't know. But folks, I saw it. It's real. And it's much, much better. In fact, it's such a big deal and it's so great, I can't even tell you now. Two problems. You wouldn't believe it. Nothing could be that good. Or you'd want to go there today. Well, he'd seen heaven. He knew and believed it, what it was, and that it was real. So going to heaven was not a fearful thing for him. He says in verse 24, Yet to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Staying on earth was totally for the sake of those he was ministering to. That's the only reason he was staying on this earth. Now, if we believe this is true, it will totally remove fear from our life. It will totally remove fear from our life if we truly believe this. But tragically, I don't think we do. Paul believed it. In verse 25, he said, convinced of this. Convinced of what? Convinced of this. What is this? What is this? Hmm? Yeah. To, this is, it's better for me to die. To physically die. I'm convinced of this. I know I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in, in the faith. Okay? Paul believed this. Verse 26. So that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. And whether he did this time, I don't, I don't really know whether this was the first or the second Roman imprisonment. I don't know. One time he did come back to him. One time he didn't. But God was in control. He did one time, the first imprisonment. Verse 27. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. We're going to talk about that. Worthy of the gospel of Christ. Worthy of the gospel that is owned by Christ. It is not my gospel. It is his gospel. It becomes my gospel in him. So that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Worthy of the gospel. Conduct yourself. How do, how do you conduct yourself worthy of the gospel? How do you do that? Talk back to me. What do you do? That's it. It's that simple. It is not where we go. It is not what we do physically. It is simply believe Him. Period. That is exactly what we do. That's what's worthy of the gospel. Standing firm. Well, how do you stand firm? One spirit, one mind, one faith of the gospel, Jesus' faith, that was given to us that we now possess. Faith is a gift. It's the faith of Christ. In verse 28, in no way alarmed by your opponents. Now, this is a biggie because in that day they were killing people. In no way alarmed by opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you. And that from God. And it says that too. Two is not in the original. And that from God. Well, let me ask you a question. Are you scared of your opponents? Are you? Are, are you? Well, I don't care what you're going through. And, and we just lost our folks over in Pakistan. We lose the internet sometimes or they lose power. But it would be very easy for them to be afraid of their opponents because they kill Christians there. None of us have to deal with that here. In most countries where you are, you don't have to deal with that. Some of you guys do have to deal with that in your countries. But here, sometimes we're afraid about people talking about us. Or we're afraid about what they think. But you're not scared of your opponents. When your enemies can't cause you to fear, they're defeated. So how do you deal with enemies? How did Paul deal with enemies? How did Jesus deal with enemies? He loved them and what? What was the other thing he did? He forgave them. He loved them and forgave them. You want to defeat an enemy? Love him and forgive him. 
It's destruction for them. They think they're destroying you, enemies. But it's salvation for you. Verse 29. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Two things. You've been granted the ability to believe. Believe is the same word as faith. You've been given the faith of Christ. You believe Christ, period. But you believe Christ through His faith given to you. You can't even do that in your own power. And you've been granted to suffer for His sake. Now what does that mean? I don't know. I don't know. But He does. Verse 30. And then we're through and we're going to talk about this one verse. And there's some cool things we're going to see right here. Experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. And I don't know why I put to be because it's not needed. It's not in the Greek. And now here in me. You saw it in me and you hear it in me. And what is the conflict? Here it is. So simple. It's amazing how simple the Word of God is. The, the Bible. If we just look at it and let the Spirit, the Teacher, reveal this to us. The One who lives inside of us. The One who comes along beside of us. Here's the conflict. To go home or to stay on this earth. We are ambassadors for Christ. This is not our home. We represent a king while we are here. So, what is it that we share as an ambassador? What is it that we share? The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. So, what do we share? He goes on to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we're to be reconcilers. So, how do we become reconcilers? Simply. We tell them, ready, about the one who has reconciled us. I can say this another way. Let me tell you, you God-hater. Let me tell you, you unbeliever. Let me tell you, you murderer, that God was in the world, in Christ Jesus, reconciling you to Himself. And it is finished. You say, they won't believe that. Some will. We don't tell people what Christ will do for them if they do their part. We tell them what Christ has done and we ask them to believe it. And believe me, that will impact people like you never saw. For real. Share the reconciliation given to men through Christ Jesus. Well, this is exciting stuff, and I hope it blessed you. It did me. I want to say, when I was reading this stuff this week, my first thought was, Lord, there's not enough here to get a message out of. <laughs> kind of comical. But uh, anyway, I love you. God loves you. You tell people, everybody you see, that God loves them. We'll see you next time. Bye.